because we're going to bring the president and CEO on, okay? And all talking will be at a whisper. Am I right? Yes. Hello? Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. I don't want to have to call you out. Because I don't play that. When I invite somebody to my home, I'm courteous to them. This is your home, New York State. And we have invited our president and CEO and our panelists here to work with us. So in workshops, you give them the highest God respect. They didn't have to do it. They took their time out on a Saturday to come here. They are all campaigning. They are all are assisting people, but they thought it not robbery to come here because they wouldn't be in their seats if it wasn't for us. Amen. Um, before we get into the meat of our program, I would just also like to recognize, recognize Carl Rodney of Care Up News, who's here. So we thank you also for being here as well. And right now, I would like to introduce the person who's going to be introducing our guest speaker, uh, Ms. Raven Waters, first vice president of the NAACP Youth and College Chapters and a national board member. Please welcome her to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <clears throat> so, I have the great pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker for the evening. And, uh, for the afternoon, my bad. You know, we are already going in the evening. <laughs> um, a native of Detroit, Michigan, Derek Johnson attended Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi. He then continued on to Houston, Texas to receive his JD from South Texas College of Law. In later years, Mr. Johnson furthered his training through fellowships with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, the George Washington University School of Political Management, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has served as an annual guest lecturer at Harvard Law School, lending his expertise as to Professor Lanny Gorner. Course, Lane Gordon's course on social uh, movements and as an adjunct professor to Tougaloo College. Mr. Johnson is a veteran activist who has dedicated his career to defending the rights and improving the lives of Mississippians. As state conference president of the Mississippi State, he led critical campaigns for voting rights and equitable education. He successfully managed two bond refer referendums campaigns in Jackson, Mississippi that brought $150 million into school building improvements and $65 million towards the construction of a new convention center, respectively. As a regional organizer at the Jackson-based nonprofit Southern Echo Incorporated, Mr. Johnson provided legal, technical, and training support for communities across the South. In recognition for his service in, to the state of Mississippi, the Chief Justice of the Mississippi State Supreme Court appointed Mr. Johnson to the Mississippi Access to Justice Commission. And the Governor of Mississippi appointed him Chair of the Governor's Commission for Recovery, Rebuilding, and Renewal after the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina, Mr. Johnson founded One Voice Incorporated to improve the quality of life for African Americans through civic engagement training and initiatives. One Voice has spawned an annual Black Leadership Summit and the Mississippi Black Leadership Institute, a nine-month training program for community leaders. On October 20, 21st, of 2017, the Executive Committee of the NAACP National Board of Directors elected Jerry, Derek Johnson President and CEO. Derek Johnson formerly served as a Vice Chairman of the NAACP National Board of Directors as well as a State Conference President of the Mississippi State Conference of the NAACP. A long-standing member of the NAACP, Mr. Johnson will guide the association through a period of re-envisioning and reinvigoration. As I uh, please rise, as I now present to you the illustrious president and CEO of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, Derek Johnson. Thank you. 
thank you. And let's give another hand to our National Youth Board member from Region 2. You know, I can recall being a youth member of the NAACP and, and being called on to present before a group. I will stumble and stamper and be nervous. So you did a good job. Yes. To President Hazel Dukes, my angel. I call her an angel because one time she wasn't happy with something I was doing. It wasn't one time, it was probably one of the, the early times, but it was a lot of stuff she wouldn't have. And she get to fussing and fussing, but I figured out, I said, oh, you so pretty, look at, look at that angel. It stopped her in her feet, she quit cussing, she said, quit, boy. I said, yeah, that's my angel there. To Judge Blackburn, who is, serves as the publisher of the Crisis Magazine, to your next Attorney General of this great state, New York. You know, I almost feel like I should have brought greetings so I could sit down and listen to the rest of the speech because it's most relevant for this state to have that type of representation during these times. To all of the elected officials that are in the house, let's give you a, a hand as well. <laughs> to the youth and college division, with all the young, the youth and college members of this great association, please stand if you're still in the room. Please stand. I started in the state of Mississippi, and Dr. Henry would say, you know, you, you, you would never get any hogs if you had no pigs. <laughs> I'm from Detroit. I said, what kind of country foolishness is that? <laughs> but I was a piglet, and now I guess I'm one of the hogs. <laughs> to the national staff uh, that's in the room, to uh, Vice President of Engagement, Jamal Watkins, please stand. Let's give him a acknowledgement. VP of Communications, Alba Blankston, please stand. Jesse Sigmund, who's administrator assistant in development, but also who keep me on time and on task, please stand. <laughs> to one of your own, the former regional director of this region and currently VP of a stakeholder relationships, Paula Edme, yes. who happened to be yes. one of the longest and oldest serving members of the national staff at the tender age of 35. <laughs> Well, it shocked me when she said, you know, I've been employed for 38 years. I said, girl, you ain't number 35 years old. Be, be quiet. Went to college. Went to the office. Straight out of college to the office. We are in a unique time. Yes, we are. The current political landscape has created a reality for us that I think we need it to jolt our understanding of who we are and yes. what we must do. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. And as unique as these political times are, it is not anything unknown to black folks in this country. Yeah. <laughs> Last night I spoke in Racine, Wisconsin, and you talk about some country folks. I looked at and I said, y'all some country folks in here. <laughs> and as we began to talk, I, began, I, you know, I also have them understand the country is cool. It's not derogatory, it's cool. Because in Racine, black folks get, got there for a reason. See, we are looking at the current political landscape thinking as a result of someone who's sitting in the White House who got elected in 2016, but this is nothing new to us. Yeah, See, the folks who were in Racine, Wisconsin that I spoke to last night, they all came from somewhere for a reason. Come on. So it's called the Black Migration. Yes. Yeah. And then that Black Migration, those individuals, some of who in that room was my family, had to leave from West Tennessee and from Arkansas and from Alabama and from Mississippi because they didn't have the power of the vote. The power to vote and that the lack of the power to vote created a political landscape that was hostile, full of hatred, utilized the opportunity to exploit us for cheap and or free labor. We've been here before. We shouldn't be shocked that we're here now because racism never went anywhere. So I was watching a, a 60 Minutes about four or five years ago and there was a brother on there who had been locked up for several years for a crime he did not commit. 
and he finally was free after he was exonerated and, and the news reporter asked him, you've been locked up for close to 30 years. What's different? What's new? How do you feel about all of the advancement in society? And he sat there and he pondered for a while. And then he thought about when he first was released. His brother picked him up. They was in the car and they was driving down the street about to make a left turn and then a voice came said, left turn 500 feet. He said, who's that white woman? How did she get in this car? <laughs> See, I've never seen a cell phone or heard of a GPS in all of the technology. And his brother started laughing and said, she, she's been here the whole time. Racism has been here the whole time. Yeah. Racism is in, isn't anything new to us, but we got a level of amnesia. And every so often we have to revisit history so we can understand the current reality. You know, it's a beautiful thing when, when we get that wake-up call. 2008, you all recall where you were in 2008? In November. Yes. What a wonderful time that was, that, that, that first Tuesday of the month, around 9 o'clock Eastern Time, 8 o'clock Central, where I live. What a wonderful time. We celebrated. I seen grown men cry, women shout, young people run up and down the street, excited about the potential of the future. How in the world could a white a brother be sitting in the White House? Some of y'all said it'd be a cold day in hell if that ever happened. It was freezing down there with the devil, wasn't it? We were excited, inebriated with the possibilities, and yet we wanted an election, and some of us don't even know how we won it. It's a bad thing when you, when you have a success and, and not know how you got there, especially when you're in a race that's never ending. So what we see leading up to 28, 2008 is the implosion of our black political machines across the country. The Harlem machine is not the Harlem machine of the old. The, the Brooklyn political machinery is not the Brooklyn pl political machine of the old. In Detroit, my whole town, Wacom Young Machine, they have a white mayor in an 80% black city. The Harold Ford machine of Memphis have exploded. We're perhaps looking at the last black mayor of Atlanta and the same for DC as well. 15 years ago, the top eight cities population had, oh my back, 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 back. 15 years ago, the top 20 cities had black, eight of them had black mayors, today only four. Oh, eight was a celebration, but we have no clue how we got there. And as a result, we woke up to a 2016 reality. Anytime we build our entire future around a personality, it's a setup for failure. See, egocentric leadership fails us every time. I oftentimes give lectures around the country and we're proud to take this position and I talked about, I asked a question of the audience, particularly young people, who led the civil rights movement? What's the answer? Martin Luther King. And then I go to the next thing, what did he do? This is not to diminish his contribution, but it's to right size the power of the collective. What did he do? And undoubtedly, a young person said, well, he led the Montgomery bus boycott. No, he didn't. Edie Nixon led that boycott along with Rosa Parks. They have been planning for years before King even came to town. Edie right. e. Nixon was the branch president of the NAACP. That's right. Rosa Parks was a secretary and a youth advisor. Vernon Johns pastored the church and was ran out of town that Martin Luther came into. And in fact, when the movement started, Martin Luther King was the third person they called it. And when they first called it, they said, let me think about it. Mm -hmm. right. What did he do? He led the, the March of Washington. No, he didn't. A Philip Randolph out of New York created the concept and with the threat in 1941 forced the integration of the armed services which led to the integration of federal jobs that some of us sit in this room we're benefit, benefit from today. He happened to get invited and was the best speaker. 
He didn't organize it. That was, that was by Rushton under the tutelage of a Philoretta. What did he do? He inspired. Yes, he did. But inspiration alone don't change policy. Defeat, hate, and vote. Teach. We must move away from this egocentric leadership model because it sets us up for failure every time. Because when a personality is off the scene, we get a 2016 reality. We get a 2016 reality. The current political landscape is, 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 is just full of racial hatred. It's full of intolerance. It's full of t tribalism at levels we have not seen in many, many generations. I was speaking to a crowd that was about 40% white and black, and I said, you know, race is nothing more than a social construct. It's a creation to manage and maintain power. Many of the white folks that was in the room, they began to look, them, look at me curiously. Some of the white guys turned red, and I say, there was a time that most of you in this room wouldn't, wouldn't be considered white. The concept of white was created to maintain power. And the reason why it was created to maintain power, because the group that was truly considered white was white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Their numbers began to shrink, and in a, in a democracy, your vote is your currency. And if you, ain't, you don't have enough currency when you go to the store, you can't buy what you want to get, right? <laughs> so they began to en enlarge the categories of who would be considered white. Because in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, if you was Irish American, you were not considered white. If you was Italian American, you was not considered white. If you was Jewish, you were not considered white. Right. If you was Polish, you was not considered white. Right. It was only when it became politically expedient and necessary to maintain control of govern government that the categories of whiteness began to expand. In fact, in New York, LaGuardia, because he was such a tactician with politics, he would carve up the city, say, these two districts here for the Irish, this one here in Harlem for the black folks, that one over there for the Italian, so he can maintain power. Teach. Race is nothing more than a social construct. And, and, and as much as we understand that, race is also a tool to maintain domination and control. See, if you want to move public policy in most corners of this nation, you put a racial argument around a piece of policy and you get white folks to vote against their interests. Let me repeat that one more time. If you want to move certain pieces of public policy, you create a racial argument around it and white folks will vote their, against their interests. Example. The majority of this country's white population did not agree with Obamacare. And in the same poll, they asked the same set of individuals, do you support the Affordable Care Act? They say, absolutely. <laughs> Race is a tool. Yes. And as a result of that, you can get segments of the population to vote against their interests, but on the other side of that street, apathy is also a tool. When black folks sit down, we lose. But when we vote, we vote the right way. And you combine those two things, the tool of race and racialized language wrapped around public policy, you get people to vote against their interests on top of black folks not voting, that's a recipe for 2016. Yeah. See, the 2016 presidential election was the first time in 20 years that the black vote share didn't increase. In 20 years. It had been on a steady incline from t that time forward. And for many of us, we think it's a result of the, la the loss of the infrastructure to turn out the vote, which was accelerated when we wrapped all of our hopes and our dreams around an egocentric personality that we love the fact that he won, but it disempowered us from continuing to build and manage and maintain and grow and develop our infrastructures. That's the space NAACP we must fill today. That's the relevancy of our organization. If the NAACP is not investing 
and turning out the vote in our communities, we no longer need to exist. Amen. For all you local leaders, <laughs> it is not about the banquet. The banquet is the vehicle to generate the revenue so you can push the message to get our folks to the polls. Mm -hmm. Say it again. For all you local leaders, yeah. it's not about the title because the title without work is a fallacy and there's no need to hold the title. For all you local leaders, if you can't look behind you and see younger people coming behind you or standing next to you or in front of you, you need to get out the way because we wasted our time. See, the NACP, we are 109 years old, not because of an egocentric personality, because it's because of a community-centric nature where we all see the power that we have. I've been married. 23 years. And boy, she chased me for the longest to try to get me to marry her. Yeah, you tell the story now. She not here. She ain't here. She can't dispute this. And if y'all said, I said, I say, no, they lying on me, baby. They lying on me. She chased me. And so because she was chasing me, I decided to go to this, this non-convent with her. Now, I'm a Baptist. And she's a Baptist, but her aunt was working at this non-convent, and she said, you need to come hear this speaker. He's amazed. You got to hear him. She said, okay, and then she said, I had to go too. Now, I don't, she don't boss me, so I went anyway, and so we sat there. <laughs> I'm getting this straight now. She don't boss me, right? <laughs> And when she try, I say, hey, baby, you so pretty. Look at you so pretty. You my other angel. And we sat there, and it was this brother. He was a priest. He had just come from a mission. He was, he was on the continent, and I don't recall which country or which village he was in. He began to tell this amazing story of how in this particular village on the continent of Africa, in a country I don't recall the name of, how they would greet each other all day and each day. And it was a word, something like namaskar, and I don't completely remember the word, but he asked one of the village elders, he said, I noticed each and every day people would greet each other with this word. What does it mean? Why are you all doing this? And that village elder says, they had translated into English, it means I see the Christ in you. <laughs> they would say that all day. Something like Namaskar, I see the Christ in you. And as he began to unfold his journey in Africa, that's the part I remember more than anything else. That when we see each other, we should see the power in each other. That we should not concede our power to some personality, some ego-driven movement without understanding that all of the power that we need is among us and not outside of us. That the savior complex that so many of us fall victim of is the most disempowering thing we could ever have. Man, with this stuff going on, boy, if Martin Luther King here was today, what would he do? No, it ain't about what Martin Luther King was do. What are you doing? I wish Obama was back on about it. No, it ain't about President Obama. It's about what are we doing? Naeem Magbar had this concept called collective consciousness. With the collective consciousness of our community, we have the power to discern what's right and what's wrong and what the imposing threats are, but somehow, some way, we lost the knowledge of the tool to push back against the threat. Yes. In a democracy, our vote is our currency. Yes. And collectively, our vote can change the direction of this current political landscape. Yes. yes. Let's be very clear about what's here. Teach. One of the things that, that, that fascinates me is when, when talking heads get on television, they begin to intellectualize the problem and theorize the solution, which have nothing to do with fixing the problem that they just talking about because they never lived it, they don't do it. They're armchair revolutionaries at best or pay talking heads. All right. See, the real work is uh, among the people in this room and the communities we work in. 
Yes. The real work is not talking about how to get there, but getting there through the hard work and collective impact that we have. You know, some of you all may have a car like mine. It ain't the best looking car. I refuse to pay a car note. When you got five kids, it make you think like that sometimes. And if I'm not careful, I will spill a drink in my cup holder and down in that cup holder could be some change. If you spill a drink in that cup holder, over time you'll clear it gets sticky. Make it plain, Mr. And every so often you may pull up to somewhere and not have enough change and left your, your debit card, so now you gotta pull up that, those sticky pennies and quarters and dimes so it can add up so you get your Big Mac. See, I said it was some country folks in Ray C. There's some country folks in here, too. But over time, you forget the value of that quarter, that dime, or that penny until you need it. See, over time, we forgot the value of all the many votes who don't show up. And they don't show up because they don't want to vote. In many cases, they don't even know the election is taking place. That's right. That's right. But you gotta understand that presidential election is the high water mark for most of us in our community. We all go out and vote. Why? Because it's a multi-billion dollar ad campaign. Billions of dollars are spent on go vote, vote for me, vote for this, vote for that, go vote, go vote, go vote. It's like a Coca-Cola sized ad campaign. <laughs> We're being reminded constantly and regularly, but midterm election is like a RC Cola ad campaign. <laughs> you only go get it if you know it exists. <laughs> Second example is some country folks in here, because some of y'all get RC Cola and then stand back pack and drink and that pot when you get a headache, right? <laughs> Second reason, it ain't just Red Sea country folks, there's country folks in here too. But country's cool. And so the, the, the importance of, the, of organizations like the NAACP and the black church and our panhandle and all of our infrastructure, we have to step in the gap and make sure those who are eligible, willing to vote, go vote so we can make up the difference and the outcome can reflect our needs and our interests. Yes, sir. We've seen yes, this sir. before. Yes. Some of you are sitting here because you are second or third generation out of the South. That's right, me. Your president out of Alabama. Yeah. She's sophisticated country. <laughs> St. John's wearing suit country. Some of you migrated, your family migrated here from the Carolinas, North and South Carolina, or Virginia, or Georgia. See, that migration was about having the power to vote and the opportunity to create a better quality of life. Some of you migrated from the Caribbean. <laughs> Looking for jobs and opportunity because the islands where you you was born where the slave ship drop you off before they drop your cousin off in the port in Charleston. <laughs> look for an opportunity because this nation and other nations was depleting the resources as they exploited the labor. Preach yeah. now. We all ended up here for very similar reasons. But in a democracy, our vote is our currency. Yes. Amen. You know, I, I grew up in Detroit, as was said earlier, and I, and I moved there because my great uncle was a World War II veteran. And he decided that he was not going to put up in West Tennessee the lack of freedoms that he had fought for abroad. So he moved to Detroit. And he set up shop. He was a bootlegger. He set up shop. <laughs> my mother, when she got of age, she followed. And, and as, uh, because my great aunt was gracious, she was like my grandmother. And I would sit under my great aunt. And she would feed me some candy out of this box. The box was labeled Argyle Starch. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Point made, y'all country. from the rural south to the north. 
She had a good life. My bootlegging uncle had worked at the plant and he was selling that liquor on the side. She had a good life. But I would sit under her as a very young child and she would pop some in her mouth and pop some in my mouth. I thought it was good. <laughs> but then I got older and I was wondering, nah, you use starch to iron your clothes. Why, why were we eating starch? <laughs> this makes no sense. And I later found out that there were times in the deep south yeah. Where there was, there was, there was, it was, it wasn't enough provisions to go around. It was the lean months, and to make it through, those Africans understood chemistry better than some of us African Americans know it now. All right. That when you ingest starch, it will have a chemical reaction and expand in your stomach, giving you a sense of being full, Teach although you're starving to death. <laughs> Teach. Teach. Think about that. Teach. Here she was, got out of that type of poverty, living in Detroit, and still eating starch. Some of you probably still eat starch today. In fact, I wanted to bet you, many of, uh, of us in this room, we've been eating starch. Yeah. Thinking that we had advanced farther than what we had actually advanced. <laughs> Thinking that as a result of one person getting elected to an office for an eight year period that was all over, that we live in a post racial society. <laughs> Thinking that, that, that we can shop at Macy's or drive cars we, would, we, we never would have conceived of, that, that it was over and we can, can kind of assimilate differently. Thinking that the tool of race was something that was behind us, All right. resulting in us waking up on that Wednesday morning in 2016 to a cold reality of this nut to be sitting in the White House. I'm here to talk about we can't eat starch anymore. We must reinvest in the NAACP and other infrastructures so we don't forget how we got here. All right. That we must collectively see each other's power in ways in which we don't concede our power to some outside savior who's going to come in and save us if we do nothing. That's right. That's right. We have the power. Yes. It is within our grasp. You know, it was my second year in undergrad. And I wasn't the sharpest guy coming out of high school. I had a 1.8 GPA. I had a ball. <laughs> had a good time. But I had to take this literature class. And Dr. Simmons was perhaps the hardest teacher in undergrad I had at that time. And he was a funny looking man. He had an afro, but he never seemed to pick right here. It was flat right here. <laughs> he was a proud man. He was a Morehouse man. He wore glasses. At some point in his life, he had an injury. One of his eyes was a glass eye. I never knew which eye was the glass eye or the real eye. <laughs> but he was a tough professor. And I love him for that, so much so that I did well that first semester. I did exceedingly well. I, for the first time, began to read and understand Shakespeare. It's one thing to read it. It's another thing to understand. It's like going to church and read the Bible. You know, it's one thing to go. It's another thing to read the Bible, and it's a world of difference to actually practice what you what was in preach and what you read. Oh, some of y'all ain't been doing that, huh? I get it. <laughs> he was, his class was stringent that when you walked in his classroom across the threshold, everyone would get quiet because you didn't, you didn't want to be singled out by Dr. Simmons. So when you cross the threshold of his class, you get quiet, you sit there. And after that first semester, in the first test, we, we took it that second semester, we entered the class, and he was, he was unusually late, and he walked in vis visibly upset. 
that Afro was there, had, still hadn't picked up those glasses was on. He passed the test out. I received my D minus. <laughs> had to look at it a couple of times. And he was, he was steaming. He snatched off his glasses. He said, some of you are resting on your laurels. But I can assure you, they ain't strong enough. The eye was looking at me. He was talking, I had a D minus, he was talking to me. Class dismissed. Let the class out early. And this day, we crossed the threshold. No one said a word. We began to walk out. I felt bad. I was embarrassed. Why did he have to talk to me that way? A young lady who sat on the side of the class, she walked next to me, perhaps the smartest person in the class. She said, he didn't have to bust me out that way. <laughs> then I realized one eye was looking over there at her, and the other eye was looking over there at me. that one of those eyes was looking at them the whole time. <laughs> Truth be told, they were and they still look at us now. We can't rest on our laurels. They're not strong enough. Yeah. That if we concede our power to a personality, an egocentric movement, we lose long term. Oh. All right. That if we refuse to see the power that's in each and every one of us, we lose long term. That if we rest on our laurels of past victories and successes and stop there, we lose long term. All right. That's right. That's right. The long term is for us to learn from those past victories and successes. The long term goal is to understand the role that everybody played to make an event successful. Not the one charismatic personality, but the collective whole. Final story, because I'm told we got to hurry up. And, and I told Ms. Dukes that I won't, I won't want to hold you any longer than Aretha Franklin funeral. So we good. We got a little time here. We got a little time here. No, no, no. I, I was there. I was at the funeral, right? I was there. You know, you see me, right? I mean, I was there eight of the ten hours. I've been doing the last two. But it was amazing testimony to her life and her legacy. An amazing opportunity to celebrate her. And it wasn't about the music that she brought, it was the stories in between the music. When Isaiah Thomas walked up there and said, I was drafted by the Pistons. And I came to town and Aretha Franklin and Coleman Young set me down and, and, and helped to help me understand the obligation to the black folks in this city. And the voice and the platform I had, that, that, that meant something to me. And the fact that I didn't even know how to balance a checkbook. And how she sat with me to help me understand the business of the profession outside of the profession. All right. And then someone else would come up. I can recall the time she watched the news and the family was burned out and she sent a, this wonderful woman that worked with her with a bag of cash say, take this money to that family so they can help them recover. Someone else would get up and say, my child did one, two, three. She heard about it, so she came to the school to be the surprise guest at the graduation because she wanted to celebrate all of, the, all of the accomplishments of the children. Then somebody else would come up and somebody else would come up. It was an amazing testimony to her legacy. Yeah. So Aretha Franklin went beyond the music. What they were talking about was were the things she was doing outside of the notoriety. Mm -hmm. You know, character is that thing you do in the dark where nobody else knows anything about it. And she wasn't seeking any type of, of recognition to do good for her community. Mm. And somebody else got up and said her father was upset with her because when Angela Davis was locked up and couldn't get bail money, she stood up and, and got bail for Angela Davis and her father said, why are you getting involved with that? You can't be involved with them people. He said, no, daddy, I'm a black woman. And this black woman is being attacked and if I don't stand up for her, who else will? Character is the thing that you do when no one's paying attention because it's the right thing to do in the middle of the night. But if you up all night tweeting, you are a character. <laughs> 
And for, for those of us in our community, we have to understand the difference between having character and being a character. For our organizations to survive and do what's necessary for our community, we have to have organizations with integrity and character to do what's necessary even if you don't get money to turn out the vote. Yeah. Yeah. Y'all didn't hear that, did you? See, the game of being paid to turn out the vote, they got to go. The day of preachers in pulpits with shiny suits say, give me $5,000, I'm going to turn out the vote, you leave that character alone. Because we have to operate with integrity and character, whether the money flow or not, we got to turn out the vote, our lives depend on it. And so if, if, if you didn't get anything else from this speech, uh -huh. let's be clear about the power we have among everybody in this room. Yes. yes. Let's not concede that to anyone else. Right. I see the Christ in all of you. I see the power in all of you. Let's, let's understand the power of collective consciousness and our collective vote. Yes, we make the difference of whether or not this democracy work or if it don't work. All right. Tell them. Let's understand that we must be an organization of integrity and character and not do the work based on the check, but do the work on the reality of our future and the protection of our kids. In, 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 in any democracy, you measure based on three basic principles, how well we care for our elderly. Yes. Are we preparing our young people for a bright future and do we protect the right of the disadvantaged? All right. All right. Say so. And if that's the measurement of the health of a, of a democracy, we are living in a sick society. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Anytime we want to contract out or privatize the future of our young people through devices called charter schools or tax credits or, or vouchers, uh -huh. it's a sick society. That's right. Uh, Says so, Mr. President. Anytime you want to undermine someone's safety net, can you imagine in 2005 had we privatized security? By the time 2008 came around, the stock market crashed, where many of us in this room would be? Anytime we allow a community to be attacked, whether they're part of our community or any other community, that's an attack on us. We must protect the rights of disadvantage. That's why we filed the DACA lawsuit. Yeah. yeah. People say, well, why would you get involved with that? That's about the Latinos. No, first of all, learn your geography. The African diaspora include many people who have been impacted by, by DACA. And folks from the diaspora are also members of the NAACP. And if you are foolish enough to think that we are so narrow, you have no character. You are a character. Say so. That's the role of the NAACP, to make this democracy work, to, to create a society that's whole and healthy. And it's our job to do so whether paychecks show up at the door or not. Come on. All right. Tell them now. Talk about it. So as you continue to convene during this 82nd state convention, mm -hmm. uh -huh. keep that front in mind. Yeah. It is not about the others who give the good speeches, it's about you and our collective ability to make our communities whole, to make our children's future bright, and stay country. All right. This country is good. <laughs>